morning, everyone. Hope you're having a good Sabbath. Hope you're enjoying the fellowship and uh, always enjoy the study we have downstairs beforehand. This morning, I want to talk on a subject that is uh, a, a set of passages, ba basically our, our writ text is found in Revelation 19. Now, Revelations, when you read what people write about revelations it can be very confusing and one of the reasons that it's so confusing is uh, well there's a lot of context there and there's a lot of stuff there but also one of the problems that most of the world has with with any prophetic verses is they don't have a good foundation because there are so many uh, I guess you could say so-called Christian doctrine that is just been twisted and is wrong and and so if you start off on the wrong foot you just can't end up with a very good interpretation but this this passage that I'm going to cover is uh, I think most people can understand it uh, the last verse which is the one that we're seeking an answer for is misused by by uh, certain ones but the, the title of the message is The Spirit of Prophecy. You may have heard that term. Uh, but it has a subtitle, and that's Effective Bible Study, because in this verse, we want to come up with some answers and understand what the scripture says. And in order to do that, you need to study the scriptures in a way that, that will bring out these truths. So you, you need to put some principles in, in practice that are effective in our, in our Bible study. And I just want to bring out the first one. The first one is prayer. Before we go to, to, uh, to the scriptures to know God's will, and it should be a great desire to know what the truth is. That should be preeminent in our seeking God, to know what the truth is. So not to want to hear God first and not what man had to say. To prove it for yourself. Uh, not, to be, not to settle to just accept whatever you're taught you're raised in or or what our society teaches that but in James 1 5 it says if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to you to him so you just have to ask and as long as your motives are right uh, it says God's more than happy to, to, to give it to you he wants you to be able to understand his word uh, for those who reach out to him and seek to him in, in, in honesty, in, in humility. Uh, and it says very simply, it'll be given to them. So that's, that's where you start when you, when you approach the scriptures. Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and read this passage that I've in Revelations. It's found in Revelation chapter 19, and we'll start with, with uh, verse 5. And as we read this, as we read uh, these contact, these passages, whenever you study the scriptures, you have to be very careful with context, because there are Greek scholars and Hebrew scholars and all kinds of scholars that have a lot of ideas, but you know, more important, much more important to know uh, Greek and Hebrew is to understand the context of the setting of what's going on and what is meant. And that is done uh, by basically keeping an open mind, not, not allowing the, our biases to, uh, to uh, lead us one way or another or however we're, we're taught, but, but we need to stay within context. And uh, we also need to use other scriptures to, uh, to find out what, what, how, how the, the scriptures balance themselves out. There, should, there is no contradiction within the scriptures. And the original is when these words are inspired and God doesn't change, does, doesn't send a, a confusing message, Man sometimes gets his fingers in there and, and corrupts the words of God, word of God. Uh, in fact, just previous to this, 
it's talking about Babylon uh, being fallen, the, the great whore, and how that the, the, all the things that they had done, martyred and cruci and, and um, martyred and, and uh, uh, the saints all these years. And this is during, this is a, a but this context that, w that we're getting ready to read is a, is, a, is a glorious thing. It's after it's all done. And uh, it's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So starting in verse 5, this is John, and he's, he's just seen this vision of uh, Babylon being fallen. It says, Then the voice came forth from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both great and small. So he, the message is to all those who fear him, all his servants, great and small, that's God's people. That's us. Uh, he's <clears throat> so he's telling us that uh, that you know they're in they're in they're they're in a the situation where they have overcome. They've made it to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we're going to get into. And uh, just praise God for this. Worship God for that. Verse 6 says, And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Here again, it's emphasizing this great multitude, which is the same, what it's talking about, term people, same people in verse 5. This great multitude uh, and, and, you know, when you have a large group of people and it's and especially if they're making a lot of noise, it just sounds like a roar of the ocean. Uh, but uh, the sound of mighty, mighty thunderings. And they're saying, Alleluia. We just sung, Alleluia. It literally means praise Yahweh. Praise God Almighty. Uh, for the Lord God Im omnipotent reigns. In other words, God is, God is uh, uh, fulfilling his... Uh, his promises, everything throughout creation that uh, has come to a culmination here. Verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made her ready. Now, this marriage of the, of the Lamb has come and made her ready. This is talking about what we're all waiting for. This is talking about something that, that every saint that ever was from Adam all the way up to now and to the Lord comes is looking for. We're looking for that marriage supper of the Lamb. And it, it literally, marriage is used in the, in the context of a joining together. We have... Those that are in included in this marriage is Jesus Christ is, is the, the bridegroom. Jesus Christ, the sinless, only begotten Son of God. We also have all the saints who uh, uh, the, the saints that have uh, let's see, I had it written down here the faithful, the saints, all those of all times, all races, kindreds, tongues, uh, that put their faith in God Almighty. But it says that uh, they, uh, they were not perfect in that we all sinned and come short of the glory. But we have made it through because Christ died for our sins. And that's the great marriage, this coming together of, of us as, as uh, unworthy with Christ that has made us worthy through his salvation and his act of, act of uh, sacrifice. Uh, it says, <clears throat> and his wife who has made herself ready. Well, that's what the bride is doing right now. The bride is making herself ready. Uh, 
this this getting ready is like uh, it, it, it describes a, a, a it's it's something that she does. It's an action. It's uh, deeds of faith. It's something you do as a result of your faith. Uh, it's it's our faith displayed by by cultivation. And when I say cultivation, it's almost like you go out and dig in a field. You you cultivate uh, a seed bed. We are the seed bed. God provides the seed. And uh, but but in our lives we cultivate this and prepare and and the scriptures, reading God's word is is uh, and uh, you know uh, living in the in, in His spirit is you know we're preparing for bliss. We're preparing for the coming promise. No sickness, no sorrow, no dying. All that will will be uh, will be after after this time. So uh, in James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20, 25, it talks about what the bride does here. It doesn't use the word bride. It's a different, different uh, uh, wording. But uh, he says in 19, he says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Uh, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified? You know, I'm in the wrong chapter. Am I not? Chapter one. We could probably make that fit, but it's not the right. Okay, here we go. Verse 19 of chapter one. You probably had it right up there. No? <laughs> anyway, uh, chapter verse 19 says, so, so then, my beloved brethren, let every, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We're given instructions how God's children are to act. What the bride does to, uh, to uh, uh, get herself ready. 21, therefore laying aside all filthiness and overflowing of, flowing of wickedness and receive with weakness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This is those acts of faith, those acts of righteousness that it talks about in this, in this verse. Uh, what uh, the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, <clears throat> so that's that's the bride getting her, that has prepared herself and and gotten herself ready. It says in verse eight. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness, the acts of the right. It doesn't just say righteousness, it just says righteous acts of the saints. Now we know that this was granted to us. You know, we're, we weren't, we weren't worthy of it. But because it was granted to us, we, we, uh, we change our conduct. We conform to Christ. We become like him. We, uh, we, uh, we practice that, this faith. Uh, <clears throat> those who, who put their faith in God have, uh, you know, we've all sinned, but uh, we don't live like sinners. God forbid, like Paul, he says, God forbid that we would do that. But we live like saints. We live like we're inheritors of, of uh, uh, we, we live in whatever way it takes to please God. I mean, this is just a, a, a great scene. You know, we look forward to this. And it's just, uh, 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 th these verses should just bolster your faith to know that that promise is there and it's coming. This great, great, uh, uh, Marriage and, and you know prophecy uses a lot of word pictures and a lot of uh, types and things and they're not the literal thing. There's not going to be probably a, a a banquet table laid out. I know a lot of people want to take certain things literally, but in our limited human capacity to understand certain things, we need some word, word pictures to help us to understand those things. And that's why that's what what's going on here is we're we're, we're given a scene to paint something that's that's glorious and uh, for us to understand that. 
In verse, verse 9, he says, Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Uh, all those who are called, you know, Jesus used a number of parables about, the, about going out and bidding those to come to the marriage. And he was talking about this, this same thing, that not everybody that's religious not everybody that knows scripture uh, has memorized and has those things, you know, they've, there's a lot of religious people, but they're not all going to be there. The Pharisees, I'm sure that they had a lot of people that knew a lot of scripture, but they were hypocrites. They were murderers. They tried to kill Jesus. They tried to, tried to kill Paul. Uh, just... Uh, they were, but but they were they missed the mark because they weren't they weren't uh, they weren't applying uh, God's word and truth and honesty and in humility. <clears throat> so, everyone that who who is uh, called to this marriage is, is blessed, and what a great blessing that is. And it, the end of the verse he says, and he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In other words, it's a testimony. This is a documentation that this is God's truth. It's, 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 uh, it's there for us to, to believe and to put our faith in. Um, then we got, get on into verse 10. And this is, uh, you know, it's interesting. John is just, just overwhelmed by this vision. And uh, he, he makes a mistake here. Verse 10, it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See thou do it not. I am a fellow servant, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. And that's what we're going to want to get into. And of thy brethren, he's saying he is a minister to, to God, just like you are, but you and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Uh, he, he says, he tells them not, you know, he's telling them not to worship him, but to worship God. We had just gone through this, this in, beginning in verse five, how that God had done all these great things. The plan of salvation has, has it come to a culmination and, uh, and God is the only one to be worshipped for that. Uh, in God's uh, providence, he, it, from the, it says that from the very foundations of the world, these things are worked out. And, and uh, now this last verse, there's three terms that people struggle with. And I, I think we need to define. It's testimony, uh, spirit, and the word prophecy. The word testimony here is it's used in a in a in a, a legal context. In a court of law, you have witnesses, and these witnesses have to swear that this is the truth, that they are giving statements of fact. And uh, that's what this this testimony is. It's a statement of fact. Uh, the Greek word for for testimony is uh, uh, materia. And uh, it, it just means witness or testimony. It's used interchangeably. In fact, in some verses, they use both words in the same verse, but it's the same Greek word that's being used. Notice how John uses this word uh, concerning Jesus. Uh, in 1 John 5, 9 through 11, it says, and I'll emphasize that word, Torah. Uh, if we receive the witness or testimony of men, the witness of God is greater. So in this court of law, God's witness is, is greater than men. Men make all, have all kinds of ideas and say a lot of things, but God's witness is greater. For this is the witness of God, same word, which he has testified of his son. 
He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. So through faith, through belief, we have that testimony in us. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. In other words, if you don't believe this witness that is verified to be true, uh, you're lying to yourself because he has not believed the testimony, it's the same word, witness, testimony, that God has given of his son. And then verse 11, and this is the testimony, same word, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. So it's all through Jesus. It's the testimony of the Father when they, when the Mount of Transfiguration and God spoke, that was God testifying. When Jesus was baptized, he said, my son in whom I am well pleased. That was God testifying. And uh, so this, this, uh, this testimony is, is uh, the, 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 the proof, the, the witness, the, the, the giving of the word that, that verifies uh, all of what is being said here. The word testimony uh, is used in, in Revelation. Now this word, this phrase, testimony of Jesus, let's go to uh, the first chapter in the second verse. I uh, really should be using the first verse of that too. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants a thing which shortly, should shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. This angel that Jesus gave from God by this, this angel says verse 2 it says who bore witness same word testimony to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw so this angel is uh, bearing witness to the word of God he's telling them what God's word says and this is given to John and we know that that uh, the first three chapters is a message to the churches it is the testimony the, uh, that, and, and prophecy that, that is supposed to go out to uh, these churches. Uh, so basically he's telling us that there's th three things that, he's, that are here. There's the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, what Jesus did, and the things that he saw in this vision. He goes on down to verse 9. He says, I, John both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is telling us that uh, him as our brother and companion in the tribulation of the kingdom. Tribulation is something that we all experience in, in the Christian walk, but uh, there's a purpose for it. Uh, and the patience of Jesus Christ. And that, that's why he's, you know, we don't know the details of how he ended up on this island, but we know that it was, it was for the word of God. It was because for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe God had to just get John in one place so that he could go out, but this message first went out to the seven churches in Asia, which were not that far off at 60, 70 miles. And there's a string of seven churches on the uh, Western Asia there. But uh, so testimony is, is one term that simply means to document, to uh, prove. The other word is, is spirit. <coughs> uh, and in the context of, of spirit, but sp the word spirit is pneuma. It means uh, literally wind, breath, or power. And, you know, in the context of we have the Holy Spirit, this spirit maybe isn't, uh, it, it, it's basically talking about the force or 
or uh, something that moves and make us al makes us alive. <coughs> so, the spirit or the or the, the godly unction that is given that that, that uh, conveys to us, you know, the truth of God is given to us through the Holy Spirit. It's God's spirit that allows us to understand the deep things, the, the truth of God. Without it, just through intel intellectual reasoning, you go astray. And that's why I think so much of what is being taught, has been taught for several thousand years, is not given through the Holy Spirit of God, but it's, it's given by the philosophies of men. And that's why we end up with all these varied and so-called doctrines, which don't coincide with the scriptures, but they, if, it, if it's too hard, they just say, well, it's a mystery and we can't understand it. But that's the way it is. Uh, I won't go into that any farther. Um, so the last term is, is prophesying. And basically prophesying is, is a declaration of that this is, comes from a, a, a Bible dictionary. I thought it would be appropriate. Uh, prob to prophesy is a declaration of that that is to be known that cannot be known by natural means. Uh, it's a message that emanates from God with reverence to the, reference to the past, present, and future. Let's look at a couple of verses here to, uh, for that. And I'd like to turn to Romans 12:6. Simple statement here. This 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 twelfth chapter of Romans it, it gives us instructions on on uh, to utilize the abilities of the gifts that God has given us. It says having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. And I want to focus on this because he's talking about prophecy. Uh, in, in verse 12, we find that, that our gift of prophecy is limited by uh, that our, the, proportion, the portion of our faith. In other words, we're only going to be able to prophesy for the amount of faith we have. Now, faith is something that is measurable in a sense because we increase our faith. The more we know God's word, the greater our faith becomes. The more we understand what God's word, the greater our faith becomes. Uh, now, some people limit this to just foretelling, which to me doesn't, in this context, it really, that's, that's limiting God's word for what it, it, we need to understand here. Because that would be saying that, uh, well, if somebody has a limited uh, if it's just foretelling, in other words, future telling, it's saying that somebody has a little faith is just going to know a little bit about the future. Well, why would you even listen to a prophet that, that just has a little faith? I, I, I don't think that's what it's telling us here. Uh, it makes much more un uh, sense to understand the word prophecy to have a much more broader meaning. In other words, and, and to use that prophecy in the teaching of the truth that to, to others, the, the revealing godly knowledge to those that are in darkness. Anytime you hear the word of God, and I mean really hear it, that's, that, that is like coming into darkness. It, it says literally, before we come to, to God, we're in darkness, and the whole world is in darkness. But uh, that, that day star, that it, it uses different terms, when it comes into our heart, we become light. Uh, because the word of God is, is, uh, becomes in us and we understand and our faith grows. Uh, so any passing on to others what God has shown to you, whether it's the basic points of salvation, uh, salvation through Christ, repentance from sin, uh, anything that, that teaches us in spiritual growth and becoming more like my, like uh, more like Christ than in or anything in God's word that helps us to understand what it what God requires of us what what God what pleases God 
all these things I think fall under this term prophecy. And I spend a little bit of time on because I think it's pretty important because um, when we just use a very narrow definition of, of this word prophecy, uh, it doesn't mean much. But this verse does mean a lot to us, it should. Uh, by, by applying this word prophecy to include any revelation of God's word, we, we, we give it a much richer meaning uh, uh, than uh, you know, when it's used that way. Uh, and if you study the context that's used in the scripture, especially the New Testament, Paul uses it that way. The gift of prophecy uh, is, is literally being able to, to tell others it's similar to evangelism and, and other things, but uh, but this verse it, that where it says, read, read, let's read it again, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. In other words, if you know God's word, share it. Share it with others, but you can only share what you know. If you're a newborn babe and you've realized God's mercy and, 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 and the, the you know, salvation that is offered to us, you can share that. But as you grow in grace and knowledge, you should be able to share more. So let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. When our faith grows, we can prophesy more. We can teach more of God's word to others. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now, this is, uh, I guess there's a, an oxymoron here. An oxymoron is like, a, a, well, I'm trying to think of an example. I had one earlier, but, it, but, uh, it's it's a it's a, a rhetorical statement. Uh, you can't have faith without uh, without having love or charity. Uh, Paul's defining prophecy as as understanding mysteries and knowledge. Uh, he doesn't mention eliminated that that uh, that it's just future telling or foretelling future events he's telling us he's telling us that uh, that it is the understanding of, of having vast knowledge and understanding and you really can't have vast knowledge and understanding of the, the mysteries of God unless you know it unless you're immersed in God's word which we all should be and we should all be headed that direction growing in grace and knowledge so if we're revealing and teaching God's understanding to those who never knew it, we're teaching something that, that was a mystery to them until you told them. And the Holy Spirit is working through you to do that. So, you know, when Jesus taught, he said that I, everything he, the Father gave him, that's what he, he taught the disciples. We do the same thing. When we learn the, the, those those souls, things that were a mystery. In other words, we we're in the dark about it, but it's not a mystery any longer. Uh, I don't accept the idea that there are, I think there are things, inconsequential things that uh, maybe we don't understand, but we, we will later, but all the points of salvation, everything that God wants us to know should not be a mystery for those who are, are mature and, and solid in their faith. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the spirit God working with him uh, so with all this in mind how do we understand what verse 10 is saying there let me read that one more time uh, go back to it it says I fell at his feet to worship him but he said see thou do it not you do not do that I am your fellow servant your brother and of your brother that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. And why should we worship God? For the testimony of Jesus, in other words, what Jesus did is the spirit of prophecy. 
In other words, if you, and, and this is, see, this is the, that's a lot of emphasis put on this because, you know, Paul is, uh, John and different ones, the, the disciples, they started out, you know, on the day of Pentecost, it, it was all Jews there. And they didn't accept, most of the Israel did not accept Jesus Christ and what he did and him as his savior. Uh, so what he's saying is, if you understand that Jesus died for our sins, that he is that Messiah, uh, that's the spirit of God's knowledge and understanding. You know, that's, Christ is the center of our salvation. He's the linchpin. Without him, there is no salvation and nothing else. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's fulfilling his plans, his promises that he's made to his children uh, th through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Uh, by receiving and accepting this witness of this testimony, this declaration of that salvation came through Christ alone, we receive that life-giving teaching and understanding. Testimony believed is knowledge received. And just a review on uh, uh, the doing effect of Bible study. I, I use this as, a, as an illustration of how to get into the word. Uh, the number one point was to petition God for wisdom and understanding in humility. Number two, read passages slowly and, and resist preconceived notions. Uh, of our own biases and what we've been taught by others. Have an open mind, but but read for what it is. It takes a, a internal honesty. Three, keep things in context. Understand the, the setting and circumstances. It always helps. Uh, don't pluck things out of the middle and use it. I see that done so much. Uh, number four, Verify these things by comparing scriptures with scriptures. God's word always agrees. And finally, meditate on, that, on these things. Look for God's will in, in all of his word. And let God's spirit bear witness to our spirit. God bless you.